All right, good afternoon, everyone. So the title of this talk is How Do I Type Data? There's no typo in the title. Uh, this talk is not about data entry or typing layouts, no matter how fascinating those are. I love Dvorak myself. Uh, but today we will talk about the elusive type data API in Drupal 8. So in the last couple of years, I've explored this once undocumented API a couple times and a few similar talks at uh, MidCamp in Chicago, Drupal Camp Atlanta, and Drupal Camp Ohio. And each time I just go a bit deeper down the rabbit hole, so to speak. Um, so one of the titles of the talk was Down the Rabbit Hole with Type Data. Before I begin, a little bit about myself. My name is Matthew Radcliffe. I work for a small software and web development company called Cosada. We're based out of Columbus and Athens, Ohio in the United States. Uh, we do. We make a visual programming software called Vuo. It's not related to Drupal, uh, but it's for visual artists and to create dynamic art installations and applications. Uh, but on the web side of things, we use Drupal. Uh, so I've been involved in the community since 2007, roughly, uh, making contributed modules. I like hacking on things. I like integrating with APIs and figuring out the unknown. And I have a lot of opinions. But enough about myself. So. To describe the talk, just a summary, I'm going to go over the concept of type data and what the use cases you might find you would use it for, and then a little bit about why you would choose type data over, say, Entity API. And finally, we'll get into working with data definitions and data types and how, how you go about using uh, data type and instantiating it through services um, and into some complex examples. And finally, we'll, we'll look at unit testing type data. So to begin with, we have, in, what, in my own words, I described the type, type data API as a meta for primitive and composite data types in Drupal that are not otherwise defined and provide a strongly typed interface that can be passed into various subsystems. So if we think back to uh, programming class, uh, in college, and you think about what a primitive data type is, that's a basic or built-in type of a programming language. Composite data types are any data type that are made up of primitive or other composite data types. So, well, you know, structs and classes. But again, we're talking about a meta around data types. So, type data API is the low-level API to describe data within Drupal and not necessarily about instantiating and creating new PHP types. It's a meta language around describing data. And I don't know about any of you, uh, but I find myself integrating Drupal with external web services APIs all the time. I mean, does anybody integrate Drupal with other, with third party APIs? Right? A lot of people. <laughs> and using those APIs, um, they often describe their own kind of data, and it's not Drupal data. Um, for instance, in, in the education world, we have the IMS Global Specifications, LTI, LIS. Uh, we, you know, I work with accounting software, Xero, um, to integrate with that. Salesforce, YouTube, you know, all sorts of APIs that describe data in their own special snowflake way. Or maybe it's Drupal that's a snowflake way. But in any case... <laughs> Uh, so I began just to kind of a history lesson here. Uh, I, one of the examples I give is, is how I integrate with the zero accounting platform. Um, so I'm just going to describe that a little bit and, and so you understand where I'm coming from in this use case. So zero provides a RESTful API, and I created a module back several years ago to integrate with the, the zero API so we can easily just post invoices with a couple clicks and go back to coding because we're not accountants. We just want to get our invoices done with, right? Um, integrating with e-commerce systems, creating bank transactions. Um, all you need to know there about zeros, you know, you have accounts receivable and bank reconciliation. So a bank transaction kind of marries the two together. Again, this, this data is stored in zero. It's off-site. And I just want, I'm not going to shill zero. It's whatever it is. And you don't really need to know accounting. But in this example, and I'm just describing the types of data. So back in, in, in Drupal 6 and Drupal 7, I created this module. And it, I'm using curl and HTTP, Drupal HTTP requests to make OAuth sign requests. I do a little form validation. And then I finally model 
the data as associative arrays because it's Drupal. We love our associative arrays. So it's not strongly typed. This was before entities. And then I also had to use uh, some external PHP libraries to, to do the, the curl stuff and things I don't really want to maintain um, like this. Um, yeah, let's move on. So to re-irritate, re when I was looking at implementing Drupal 8 and implementing my module in Drupal 8, uh, the goal was, again, is to make HTTP requests to integrate with external systems. And what I want and what I need is to describe zero types into something that Drupal understands and vice versa. So I have both primitive and com complex data types. And, they're, and these need to be flexible enough to handle the custom use case of not relying on storage. So I, again, I don't like storing things in two places. It's just m my opinion. Um, so that was one of my little criteria. So as I begin looking at Drupal 8, we have these awesome things like Guzzle and, and the OAuth subscriber plugin. We have Composer to bring in all, all these libraries. Uh, but again, I don't really want to go into Guzzle because there's another session and, about, uh, and Composer because there's another session about uh, Composer on Thursday. But to make a long story short, I found a nice little Symphony bundle. I was able to pull that in so I could, I could uh, handle pretty much the Guzzle stuff on its own. I can focus on other things. We also got the serialization module, which ties into type data. And I'll explain that in a little bit. And that comes, again, a little history lesson. Back in 2012 in Munich, um, I was around in a birds of a feather session in, around a table in the coder lounge. Um, and I was surrounded by all these fascinating people who were talking about the HTTP specification and RESTful APIs. And the end result of that was we brought in the serializer component into Drupal core, and we created the serialization module. So I got serializer. I've got guzzle. That has pretty much solved most of my module. But the, the one thing that's missing, of course, is, is a way of describing data. And that's where I found type data. I mean, it makes sense, something that's called type data, describing data types. So I was like, oh, OK, this, this sounds like what I need, right? So looking at the types of data I'm, I'm integrating in my use case, I've got simple um, data types like amounts or tax amounts. Like they're integers and floats. I've got relatively simple but structured types, such as accounts. These are bank accounts or sales accounts. And I've got uh, relatively complex types, such as an invoice, which include other data types like accounts and contacts and a list of line items, uh, amongst other things. So again, I've, I've, speaking of line items, line items aren't themselves kind of on their own. They're inclusive. They're only included in, in other data types. So I began to evaluate type data and say, OK, why type data? It looks like a flexible way of def defining and describing my data types um, from outside of Drupal. Uh, type data is injectable. All right, I can use it in forms and routes, route controllers, normalizers. So it's going to fit in with these other tools that I found. And uh, in my opinion, I think that, that type data will work well with other core and contrib modules, um, such as rules. On the other hand, type data is kind of is a low-level API. So if you're used to the entity API and all the, the cool things you get, like access handlers, form handlers, caching, you know, type data is, is low enough, is a low, lower level API where you don't get those those things. So that, you, know, you have to kind of weigh whether you're describing data that, that really needs all those things. Um, or you're describing data that, that, that's kind of on its own. In my opinion, in this case, I think that the API had too much baggage. So that's why I looked at implementing type data. Um, again, you, know, you can override and ignore things, but will other contrib modules behave the same way if I, if I make and I implement entities and, and I'm, end up not using them? So I just wanted them to have a lower level representation. And I think that's a better fit for external APIs. All right, that's my use case. So a little bit about type data 
And it really comes down to this one class, and that is the map class. And that is the one complex data type in Drupal that does not describe an entity. So maps are basically associative arrays. <laughs> okay, maybe that's maybe that's a, a little exaggeration. So so a map, you know, like kind of like the hash map in uh, or the hash in C sharp. Um, it, it's an iterator, so you can you can do iteration on it. You have definite, you know, you can define properties, so you can have constraints. So it's a little bit more than an associative array. And so. so when I talk about maps, usually every complex data type I have is extending map in a certain way, just because it's so flexible. So I, how do I define a data type? Well, it's a plugin, like most things in Drupal. Uh, this plugin extends the, the type data class or the map class. Uh, is anybody not familiar with what a plugin is? Good. They're all the things. <laughs> um, you know, the, the data. The data, the data type uh, plugin has a constructor that I usually inherit, so I'm, a lot of my classes are pretty much empty. So it's, it's pretty much implementing a class, and, I can, and that's why I'm using map. Although you might want to add some useful methods. So what, is the, what does the plugin look like? Uh, we've got our uh, annotation type, right? Data type. We've got our plugin ID, um, a translation for a label. And then I'm going to skip down here to the list data type. A list data type isn't necessary for all type data, but it can be particularly useful if you're implementing a, a web service and you need to, to target uh, a specific, like um, to, do, to, to target a specific uh, normalizer. And then finally, we have something called a, a data definition class or definition class. So, what is a data definition? And that's where we are describing properties. This is very, you're probably kind of thinking it's similar, and of course it is similar because it's the lower level API. It's similar to your base field definitions that you're using in your in entity API. But it's, again, it's much lower level. You're, you're only defining properties. You know, definitions offer constraints such as regex, choice, you know, all the symphony constraints that we're, we're now getting used to. Um, you probably sh can't implement some of the Drupal constraints like allowed value because it's got some implications about entities. And you can you know, assign labels and descriptions. Um, and each, each data definition describes another data type. So again, the difference between a data type and a data definition is, is sort of similar to the, the fact that the, the definition describes properties of a data type. And the, and the data type is, is the logical means of representing the, the data. So an example of a definition, let's say I'm, I'm implementing a color. It's, uh, it has three properties, red, green, and blue. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe this as the typed example color. It's an, it's an example module of mine. So we have the each... Each data definition create, you know, we use the create method, static method, and we supply a type, or which is the, the plugin ID, the data type plugin ID. So again, this is very similar to base field definition and the create method on that. Where we, we pretty much just implement a get property definitions uh, method in your, de in your definition class, and it's probably going to extend complex data definition base. And I'm not sure if anyone else is confused, but I see get property definitions, data definitions, property definitions, data definitions, return this property definitions, right? It's like I'm at Disneyland. I'm going around and around at the teacup ride. And type data can be confusing because uh, some of the terms are similar. And it's, it is also recursive. So you have to, when you're going through it in your debugger, you're, you're constantly going back and forth through type data manager. In another um, example here, I'm describing a, a more complex type. So in this, this, uh, this data definition is to describe a type that uses the previous definition and sets it to the primary color. And again, this is an example. Let's say I'm describing a, a set of colors. 
Um, and, you know, when you describe a set of colors, you have your primary color and your secondary colors, you know, your color wheel. And never thought you'd hear color theory being mentioned in a coding and development session, did you? <laughs> well, so we get down, um, down here to the, the list data definition, which is a little different. So what a list data definition does is allow us to uh, describe a property on our, on our data um, that, that's an array, uh, an I basically an index, acts as an indexed array, of a typed index array. So we use list data definition as the class, but the, the actual data type class is going to be um, uh, you know, the item class of, of um, that, that data type. Again, just to highlight that. So let's apply what we now know to a different example. So let's say we are implementing a Spotify API, um, just as an example. Spotify has you know, an album model, which has tr a list of tracks, a list of artists, a type, a name. So how would we go about describing that in Drupal and in data definition? So we would have an album definition as our data definition class. It would describe our, our get property definitions would describe a list of properties. So we have name and type and artists. And each property is instantiated with a data definition of a certain type. All right, so it's starting to make sense to visualize it in this way. You can map out your, your data types. All right, so that's, that's, that, that's about it for how to create data types, but how do you actually use type data, right? And uh, so a summary of that, there's a couple ways to start instantiating data types. You can use the type data manager. So we have a plugin manager to create uh, data types and, and data uh, based out of um, default values. One of the biggest uses of type data is the normalization service. That help, and I'm using this myself to transform the zero, what the, the data I get from the API into something Drupal understands. And then through that, you can use Serializer and Guzzle in a consistent and maintainable way to, to communicate with third-party APIs. And then I've also started to explore type data um, beyond what is, what is out of the box um, to, to add some kind of helpers, which, will, which I'll get into in a little bit. So the basics, very similar to Entity API. We have getters and we have setters on our, on our type data classes. And we have the, the, you also have the get value and set value. These are also available, you know, you see these, you probably have seen these and used these in Entity API, and that's because you're going down level all the way down to those primitive data types eventually. Now, get value is going to return uh, native PHP types like array or string, but it's not going to return you an integer or float, um, particularly in the, the default type data normalizer is always going to return you a string. Um, so if, you're, if you want, have like a very specific use case for, for exposing um, strict integer and float types in your API in JavaScript, um, then you'll have to work around that by using the get casted value method. And finally, type data manager creates data from definitions. So let's try and do that. So this example, again, is coming from my typed example module, which I've recently published in my sandbox. To do that, it's type data manager is a service. We, we get the service, hopefully through injection and not through the, the Drupal object. Uh, we call the create data definition method, and we provide it a type. So this is going to return the, the definition, the, that complex data definition that we defined earlier. And then I can give it some default values if I want. So again, when you use map, your, your values that you're, if you want to create is just an associative array. Again, map is almost like an associative array itself. And then I can use the create method on type data manager to actually create an instance of a data type um, defined by the definition with those default values. Moving on. Say we want to get the representation for the primary attribute or property. Uh, we, we, you would get, if you use the get method, you're going to get the 
type data representation. But if let's say I wanted to get the actual raw value, again, I would need to go and call get value or get casted value on that, on that, that return value. If I did, for instance, data get value, that would return to me an associative array similar to what we saw over here. Yeah, I'm skip a slide here. All right, how about another example? So let's say I want to create a form, a select list in a form, populated by type data. So I do this in my, my zero module, providing a select list of, of accounts, default accounts. Um, we'll ignore kind of this black box method for now. All it's going to return is a list of accounts, which, um, um, you know, through, through Guzzle. I can, because I'm using uh, the complex data and using map, um, my account, it's an iterator, so I can go through each account, get the property for code, and, and get its actual raw value, and then create a, a little associative array to then populate my select list down below. Sorry to make sense. This Kind of you know familiar with the the entity API. So let's go into a little bit more of an advanced example about normalization. So I had to kind of figure this out on my own a couple of years ago, uh, since there was no documentation at the time. And normalization is is the act of transforming data um, to a normalized form from like a specific form. So uh, we have our our data our Drupal data types, and normalization is going to turn them into uh, what is needed, a uh, generic form, so what, what is needed for communicating with the API. If you've never defined a normalizer before, it's, again, it's, a, it's another service. It's a tagged service, which uh, basically means it has another compiler compa pass, if you're not familiar with the, uh, the, the Symfony container. Um, so the, so these, these services uh, have like a little extra thing going on with them. Uh, you'll want to in inject the type data manager service. The first um, important thing to remember about the uh, normalization class is this supported interfacer class. And actually, just recently, there was a commit in, I think it's coming in 8.2, that makes this optional. Uh, but for me, I need to implement this because Zero being a special Snowflake API has some requirements. That, and so I want to target my, my data type. So this is one way of of having your normal, you know, have a normalizer be restricted to just your data types to have to have it implement an interface. Uh, skipping down a little bit, I'm going to ignore the normalize method, uh, which is pretty straightforward. Um, so when I get data back from the API, I denormalize it into type data. Again, I'm going to use the type data manager to create a list data definition, and then you'll see this use of this context variable. The context parameter doesn't really have any documentation around it in Symfony. It's coming from Symfony. And this is one of the gotchas that I, I, I ran into. It's like, what is, what is this context parameter? And it's essentially just a free form um, parameter that serializers and, and normalizers use. So it could be anything. But in this case, I, we pass the plugin, uh, the plugin ID via the plugin ID key uh, of the context parameter. Again, the context parameter was added in 2013. I, the commit message for it is, is kind of amusing. Um, Benjamin Eberle um, committed uh, completely refactor the serializer options pull request to push context information directly and avoid state de and dependencies between serializer interface and encoders slash normalizers. Again, not really straightforward of what that means, and that's literally all the documentation there is on that. In, except for this session. Uh, so um, how do I use a normalizer? And, you know, a normalizer is great by itself. It's not really going to do anything. Uh, so guzzle and serializer is, is how you do that. Um, I'm, there's an excellent session on guzzle on Thursday at 10.45. Unfortunately, the same time as that composer session. Uh, <laughs> so you'll have to choose your battles there. Uh, so let's, let's uh, run through a little quick example. Um, the first thing I need to do is I need to serialize my data. So this is how normalizer works. You call serialize on it. 
and then serialize, the serializer component in Symfony is going to go down the chain and, and normalize first and then call the encoder um, to encode the, the data in XML or JSON. So here's that context parameter again. Again, I've got an extra thing in there, just a, you know, a random thing, not documented anywhere. Um, I call serialize on it. I'm sorry, I call serialize on the data. So that's my data type, that I, my instantiation of type data. And then I you know, give it a format and give it the context. I get the, um, the uh, XML back, in this case, and my, I put it in my body of the message I'm going to send. And then I call the Gussel client method um, with, the, with the appropriate method on the endpoint, passing in uh, request options. And I get back a nice PSR7 response. And then I can, then with my response, and I'm lucky in that when I post an account, I get an account. <laughs> May not always be the case in the APIs you implement, but it should be. I will get, I will deserialize the contents of that body into the respective uh, type data. And, and that's essentially what I'm using most about type data in zero. But I need a little bit more. So I, I in zero, I implemented a kind of like a, a little class to help me build forms. So I've recently abstracted that out into the typed element builder service in, a, in, in the typed widget module. So this creates, dyna it dynamically creates form elements from data definitions and plugin IDs. Uh, it even supports entities and fields. Uh, but its main use case is for things that implement map and primitive data types. Uh, hopefully, maybe I can, I'm working with Fago to maybe make this, to, it might, we might put it into rules as well, uh, to, you know, to drive the data selectors that you, you know, in rules, because it essentially does what, what that does. Uh, so it's a, it's a little, uh, it's pretty easy to use. I'll give an example. So we have basically this one method that's, that I primarily use it for is get element for. I pass it the plugin ID of the data type, and I get a form element back. In this case, date time ISO 8601 type is going to return the HTML5 um, you know, form element, render element in Drupal that gives me a, an HTML5 uh, date element. Um, and uh, I can do like get element for on the, the data, data representation for user which at the moment is just going to call the form handler for entities. Or I can just get a, I can pass a second option to get just the mail property on the, the entity user um, uh, data definition. So a little example. Again, let's say I have a form. Is it playing? Yep. So I have a form. I get my element builder. I call my method get element for, I pass it a plugin ID. So we're going to use that same complex data type that had the name, the primary color, and the secondary color list. I can then, uh, skipping down a little bit, let's look at the submit for this. I have a form, I can get my values from my form state, right? That's familiar in Drupal 8. And then using type data manager, I create my data definition from my, uh, my using a data type. And then with the data definition, I can get back to type data using type data manager's create method, passing in my definition and my form state values. So I just basically created a form, you know, a form in about three lines of code. If I, you know, other than writing that class, so it looks it would look a little bit like this. All right, the color red. <laughs> In this case, it, it, it created an HTML5 element, so I have all that nice, fancy browser validation. There's me failing to select with a mouse. <laughs> Show you. And that's it. I, so that's my module that I wrote recently. It's now on, on Drupal.org. Um, does anybody like it? No? Awesome? Okay. <laughs> that made me feel better. Now it might get a stable release. So I think it's in its infancy. It's, I, I think the code is kind of ugly, and it needs to be improved. It needs help to make it a little bit more extendable. So I'm, I'm you know, if you have opinions on this, please go ahead and post in the issue queue. Um, it, I'd, I'd like to, 
to to add a little bit to it, I think that type data, when you implement your own type data, you're missing things like like you get on on fields or on uh, entities like form handlers. So maybe we can you know add to the like a, a default interface uh, or abstract class um, that builds a form you know you know uh, build element or view element. Uh, I'm doing that a little bit in in zero module. Okay, so that was really cool, right? That's an awesome little thing. Now we're gonna go to something a little bit uglier. We're going a little downer. I'm not sure why I chose that path. <laughs> but we're going to talk about PHP unit and type data. Uh, I like unit tests. They're awesome and fast. But type data manager is big and scary. Type data calls itself, so mocking is not straightforward. And data definitions use static methods, which is not great. Again, static methods are not great for isolating unit tests. Uh, and you also need to mock the service container. But on the other hand, I, I like seeing pretty coverage and complexity graphs. So um, that's why I went down that rabbit hole. Uh, one of the questions I like to ask myself, and what I'll, I'll answer here in the following code slides, is what is actually necessary for decent code coverage? Um, and again, this is something you could ask yourself as you're watching these two other sessions. You know, One today at 5, um, automated testing. Uh, PHP unit all the way. So I, again, if you want to learn PHP unit, you probably should go to that session. Um, I cut out a few slides because I didn't want to steal their thunder. Um, and again, there's another one about evaluating different types of testing tomorrow at 1045. So I highly suggest going to those sessions if, you, if you're interested in, in PHP unit. Unit tests for data definitions are pretty easy to get coverage on, right? I, I usually only have the get property definitions method and all it's doing is returning an array, an associative array of property names of other data definitions. And those data definitions are usually covered by course tests. <laughs> so I'm not sure what the value, how much value there is in, in, in testing this, other than just getting coverage, um, simple coverage. Um, for example, if I look at you know, this test, I'm testing that color class, right? You know, I really just have to instantiate the color definition, uh, and then call the get property definitions. And you know, what am I testing? The labels? Eh, me. Eh. There's no logic there, right? <laughs> I don't. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't really see that that much value value in that. Um, but on the other hand, we've got something a little bit more complex, and that that is uh, type data manager, and and it's a little bit uglier. Uh, so. One of the issues with, with testing type data is that the type data manager, uh, when it calls its create method, um, it, or when data definitions are called through their create method, the complex ones will call type data, data manager through the Drupal object. And this is bad, right? Um, we have to mock a service container. Um, we can't inject, the, the dependency isn't injected. Um, sometimes we need to mock the objects in a specific order. So, like in my normalizer class, you know, um, I I need to return things in a, in a certain order, so that type data type when I call type data manager, it's going to go recursively down through the the data type. So it has to be done in a certain order. Uh, again, when I originally wrote a class, I hadn't found the return value map method, which helped a lot later. Um, so you can be maybe a little a little sloppy. If order isn't important, but if order is important, you, ha you know you might have to rely on things you know, consecutively mocking objects, which is you know I, I think is an anti-pattern. Uh, the main method you're going to mock is the get property instance method. Uh, there sometimes I mock the get definition method and get definitions, uh, but mainly uh, I really just need to mock get property instance and I, and, and return a, a mock of the of the data type. Uh, so an example with Prophecy, if you're not familiar with Prophecy, that is included in Drupal core. It's what's called an opinionated uh, testing framework. But n nowhere does it say why it's opinionated. So the, you have to find, you, you'll, if you dig in the issue queue on GitHub, you'll find out that it's opinionated because it doesn't mock the bad things like static methods, magic methods, or methods that return the this object. So uh, methods are useful for object chaining. So if you need to do any of those, you can't use Prophecy. 
but prophecy does is usually a little less verbose. So without further ado, um, here's some a bunch of slides of code. <laughs> Uh, so the, the, this first set of um, calls is, is pretty simple. I'm not using prophecy. So when I'm, I'm, I don't usually bother with mocking the simple primitive data types because it's just so easy to do so. Um, I'm not really saving any time. So I'm going to mock out some, a string, a, f a couple floats, you know, my float for a color. And then finally down here, I'm going to, to prophesize the, the, uh, the color data type. And I'll just, for now, I'm just uh, uh, mocking the, the get method with the red parameter to return this float data I set up here. And then down here, um, I'm, I'm really lazy in this example, actually. So <laughs> I instantiate a list, an item list. Um, sorry, I, I mock, I prophesize an item list class. And then I, you know, it's an item list is, is sort of like an index array, so I mock the get method with the with the, the first index. And again, I'm lazy, so I'm just returning the same data type I instantiate there. Um, that's probably, but I'm uh, I'm lazy. So type data manager, I prophesize that, and I'm going to just mock out get property instance uh, with different arguments. And then, you know, I have to build a container and set my type data manager service into the container. And then finally, I can create my data type and, and call the set value method on it. And, and again, set value, I just pass in like an associative array as, as my values. So what am I testing? This is what I'm testing. One line I'm testing. This, this is kind of, I did all that. So I could basically assert that when I call the getter on my my custom data type, I get the right class. And that's all, I, that's all the value I can get out of it. And, and the reason is I've mocked those, the, the, the return values of that getter is mocked out. So if I said, get, if, I want, if I asserted that the, the return value of get red, get value was 255, who, it doesn't, there's no value because I've, I just mocked that value. I am like, hey, all right, that's not a valid test. So really, I, you know, that's pretty much what my goal is in, in testing, is, is to assert that I'm getting the right instance out of it. Um, this is just using a simple little data provider um, to make it even shorter in, in this example. So let's look at something, you know, using the, the PHP unit mocks. Uh, so this is what I, you know, I, I learned prophecy a little, like in the last year, but I wrote the test for zero like two and a half years ago. Um, so this is a little uglier. I'm testing my normalizer class. I mentioned before that I didn't find the return value map method until <laughs> after I'd written this, uh, written the code for this a while ago. So what I have to do here is, um, you know, call this a little bit more verbose code. Um, mock out the create uh, method, mock out the get property instance method, and then I, and I have to go, and this is just a small snippet. This function is huge because <laughs> I have to, I have all this data here that I'm, I'm mocking, and then I, I have all these other data definitions that I have to instantiate and mock. Um, there's one that's even longer because I have to, I have a code path that splits whether you have one item or two items and the, the, the output is slightly different. Uh, but that's, a, again, essentially so I can call the normalize method uh, with my items and assert that uh, I got an associative array that matches um, my expected input for, for zero based on my type data. That's a lot, right? I just showed you, like, what, four or five lines of five slides of code, something like that. So to apologize, I wrote a poem about mocking Drupal. What I learned not to do, I resign myself to that fate. Besides, Core does it too. So please do not hate this container so small is not actually in my app at all. I do not wish to load or directly invoke the container to get variables into my code, but to be a better maintainer, forgive what I leverage. All I want is pretty coverage. An alternative opinion, 
Um, <laughs> is that I'm crazy. It, and, you know, it's, it's true. I, why go through all of that, right? I mean, that was a lot of effort to, to run tests, you know, to, 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 to do all that. Uh, I mean, the reason is my previous code wasn't testable. And I used untyped associative arrays. I wasn't strictly typed. And I, if I wanted to use an um, integration test, I couldn't do it. Because if you've ever written an automated test for an external API before in a public repository, you can't go embedding your API keys into GitHub or Drupal.org. That's, you know, you're going to get stolen. <laughs> All right? So this is something that, you know, you have to do that if you're implementing uh, web services APIs and you want to, to have code coverage. And I also think that data definitions and types better model non-Drupal data, uh, which makes it a little less complex to integrate um, on the normalization side. And, you, know, you probably could get away with just doing a normalizer, uh, a custom normalizer, but you'd, again, you'd have to, to really to target that entity that you've, you've done. And I don't, I don't need storage. I don't need uh, access handlers. I'll let my forms deal with that, and my routes deal with access, and my REST things will deal with access. Um, and uh, I, I think it will integrate better with, with, with uh, Drupal Contrib. So what did we cover today? Well, we went over how to create data types and data definition plugins. Uh, we went over how to use type data and how to instantiate um, data types and use it with serializer and to implement, uh, to integrate with a third party API. And uh, I showed off typed widget to dynamically create forms from data definitions. And we looked a little bit about testing uh, with, uh, with uh, PHP unit to mock type data manager. Uh, there's still a lot more to learn. I'm still going down the rabbit hole. Like there's type config, uh, which is another topic of its own. So there's a similar service for, for uh, creating and, and data types from configuration. Um, I think there's a lot of to-dos there to turn it into type data. But I'd like to open up the floor to ask or discuss or share um, type data use cases, questions about type data manager, type widget, um, comments about type data API, complexity improvements. We also have the evaluate the session, if you could, or you can tweet me. Um, my, again, my username on, on Drupal.org is mradcliffe, uh, but I am Matt Kinnamay on, on Twitter. Any questions? Go ahead and uh, step up if you, I know it's a little hard. If you use the mic, that would be appreciated. Yep. <clears throat> in the example, in one of the uh, slides in the beginning, there was the getter where it said get red, or, or no, no, actually get primary and then get red. Uh, is there a way of doing it without strings? Like, it's type data anyway, so it should be possible to use a variable name or something. Yes. Uh, so the question is: Is it possible to use like a variable name to to get to use the getter? Um, and 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 that and the answer is yes. I mean, I, I could have um, created a, a a function to say, hey, get just get a property name and then pass that property name in. Um, and th th yeah, you can do that. Um, I just for the sake sake of an example, I wanted to be verbose. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that answers your question. Okay. Yeah, can you step up to the mic? Okay. What about data storage? What if I want to store data somewhere in database, for example? Okay, so the the question was, what about data storage, and, and what if I wanted to store data in, in the database? So, again, the disadvantage of type data is that you don't get all the nice, the nice-to-haves like the entity. So entities provide storage. You get field storage. Um, so you would have to implement your own. So if you really didn't want to use entities and you wanted to implement your type data with storage, you could then um, per perhaps implement a service that, that calls the database service and then uh, you know, do, the, you know, do queries yourself to insert data um, based, on, based on that. Uh, an example could be storing data in a JSON type. That that's actually would be a really fascinating little module to write would be to, to create like an entity storage layer um, that instead of saving data in, in the columns, just 
um, uses serializer to JSON encode and store it in the in the database directly, or sorry, JSON decode. Um, I think that would be a, yeah, a fun little module. It's particularly if you use PostgreSQL. Did that answer your question? I think you mentioned it, uh, it's just to confirm, but does the entity API, then the field API, eventually trickle down to the type data, So, or is that completely separate? So the question is, does the entity API and the field API trickle down to and use type data, data API? And the answer is yes. So uh, when because your entity field definitions, so if you think about base field definition, so if I create a base field definition of integer, that is actually a field item of field item integer, and that's composed itself of property definitions, and those are usually uh, implementing data definition, and so the, the data definition create methods on 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 the on the field item integers properties are going to be uh, primitive data types, and so eventually when you call um, get um, on that on that property on the entity, you then have to call get value, which is probably I believe is wrapping calls down to to the primitive data types. Do you have any other questions? Okay, uh, one last thing. I'd like to welcome everyone to join us for the contribution sprints on Friday. We had the first time sprint, sprinter workshop uh, to help set up a Drupal 8 environment to work, work on core. Uh, we had the mentored core sprint uh, where people like myself, I'm a mentor, you know, work with, with us to, to work on issues. We're, and then also the general sprints, if you're more familiar with core process, to, to join, just join the general sprints and, and work on a topic. Um, like type widget, although I'm not sure if I'll be have much time on Friday to, to do that as a mentor. Um, you're welcome to to submit patches for for type widget or maybe rules. Uh, work with Fago, uh, see if he needs help on on implementing type data in rules. One more uh, we have another question. Go ahead. Can you store the data uh, into the field? So the question is, can I store type data into a field into a field value? So um, you probably you, there is nothing that will save field values outside of an entity. So that, again, if you you probably just use an entity to do that and use field off an entity, um, you you could theoretically. Um, you might have to override some methods on your field type, or you know, basically ignore some methods on on that field type. But you could you know get the value, and then um, uh, again, you'd have to go through database storage, a service similar to your other question. Yep. Yeah, so yeah, Peter um, has mentioned that he is. Well, you, you go ahead and repeat what you said. <laughs> Pretend this didn't happen before. So just to add to that question, I've actually done that. Um, you can store type data in a dumb field that's serialized in the database. Um, you have to use the core data type of any, which allows any type of data to be stored. It doesn't make any assumptions about what it is. And you make sure that your field handler is actually returning the correct type data by basically adding a step that creates the instance of type data from that serialized data. So I've got some examples. If you want to talk through it after, I can show you as well. So. All right, if there's any more questions, you just see me afterwards. Um, 
let you go and have a break and get, enjoy the next session. <laughs>